Hey guys, it's Dr. May. How are you? Um, I've been excited to um, get ready to share this video with you today because it's very positive and I think um, you'll find it really helpful too. And I believe it's going to help you discover some good positive resources within yourself that you may have overlooked. Um, so I think it'll kind of highlight some of your, um, your strengths and help you find ways to bring them into your life a little bit more. Okay, so whoops, I forgot to click the share screen button. All right, here we go. It's called Taking Inventory Categories of Resources. All right, so if you watched the previous video, we had talked about survival resources. So survival resources are things that we instinctively figured out to do in order to get through traumatic or really tough, challenging situations, especially when we were younger. And they really helped us to adapt and get through those things. But when they become patterns and they last into our current life, they could get in the way of our life now. Um, but these are what they call creative resources. And we're going to go over different categories of these creative resources and how we could replace some survival resources with creative resources and use this in a more positive way now. Um, not in an extreme survival way, but in a way that just helps us cope in a healthier manner. Okay, so we're going to go through all these different categories and talk about how they're both internal and external versions of each of these resources. So there's a lot to talk about. So buckle up, get ready. Okay, so some of the goals today, all right? So to recognize resources you currently use, but may not even realize are resources. So chances are, I bet you, there are things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that are helpful for you that you didn't even count as a coping skill or a resource. But today, I bet you'll recognize that it, that it does count, all right? And you're gonna expand the internal and external resources available to you. So once you see what could be possible in all these topics, I bet you'll say, you know what? I can do that, or I could do that, or I, have, I used to do this, but I haven't done it in a while. Maybe I could bring it back into my repertoire, or maybe there's something I do a little bit that I could do even more right now. So I bet it's gonna give you a lot of good ideas. Okay, here's a great one. Expand your identity so you could see yourself as someone with resources rather as, than someone who just has a lot of problems. Like if you're really down on yourself, you might just, you know, think oh, I'm just a screw up I, or I, I messed up in this way in my life or this is going wrong and that's going wrong. But I bet if you really could recognize the resources you have or you could expand upon, it'll make you feel a little bit better about yourself and have a more balanced view, an accurate view of what you can do. All right, then also to validate and acknowledge resources rather than minimize them, right? Because sometimes even if we know that they're there, we're like, ah, eh, that doesn't count. That's not so great. But we could really just accept it for what it is, right? And give ourselves credit where credit is due. And to learn to embody resources, because of course, this is sensory motor psychotherapy. We got to really feel what we feel and recognize how it impacts our body when we're in a resource mode, okay? And that'll help us appreciate them and use them even better. Okay, so benefits. So this is the why bother. Why are we learning all this today? So resources have a lot of advantages um, when we could capitalize on them. So when we employ a resource, it helps us to feel safer, right? So if you've had a history of trauma, chances are you have an internal feeling of not being so safe or not being in control. But if you're able to deliberately use a resource, it can help you have the greater internal feeling of being safe and being stronger um, and have more agency, being able to make a choice being able to be more competent, creative, and even like peaceful. Like it could help you calm down in certain times. It can make you feel a little lighter rather than really heavy and depressed. Um, it could help shift our arousal. So like we talked about in the lesson about window of tolerance, sometimes our arousal gets very high and we get very anxious and revved up. And other times it, we're hypo aroused and our arousal goes down and we feel kind of sluggish and dead inside. Well, when we use a resource, we could use it to bring our arousal up when we're hypo aroused or calm our arousal down when we're hyper aroused. Okay, so it helps us to stay in that comfortable, optimal window of tolerance level of arousal. Um, and also, even if let's say it's midnight 
<laughs> and you're just laying in bed and you don't have a lot of resources at the moment, except for just laying in bed and enjoying the comfort of your bed. But if you imagine yourself you, at, a, at a time when you used a resource, think about a time when you did something that was creative and useful and helpful, it could shift the way you feel in your body and it could shift your experience of the five building blocks of experience. All right. And so that even in itself, even just the visualization of it could be beneficial. Okay. And one of the good things is that they're all interconnected. And as you develop one resource, it could also help you develop another. It kind of, um, the progress builds upon each other. So that's one of the good things here too. Okay, so like I mentioned a little earlier, we're gonna separate and talk about the internal resources as well as external resources. So as you can see in this little diagram, so the internal is stuff that originates within us. Okay, so it's, it's within yourself. It has nothing to do with what's going around you. Okay, the external has to do with other things in your environment that allows you to capitalize better on your internal resources. So they really work hand in hand. You have to have it within you first, and then you have to have access to certain things in your environment that allow you to materialize certain of the resources you have in your heart, okay? All right, so here we go. All right, we're gonna get started um, going one by one through all these resources and talk about the internal version as well as the external version, all right? So it might help if you wanna take notes, okay? So maybe get your journal or something to write down. So you could notate as we go along which resources you already have that you believe you have, even if you haven't used them in a while. And maybe some resources you would like to do more of or experiment with, okay? So keep a running list and it'll help you at the end when we do the exercises, okay? Because there's a lot of material. It's gonna be hard to just remember it. All right, so here we go. We're gonna start with relational resources. So this has to do with relationships. But in order to relate to others, we have to have certain capacities within ourselves. So I have to feel that I have a sense of valuing and deserving friendships and, and relationships with family members perhaps. So sometimes, you know, this is impaired because of my earlier experiences. I might not feel I'm worth being loved. Like if I have a feeling of shame, I feel like I'm not worthy of relationship. But I could always try to develop that more and get to the place where I could accept that I'm worthy of relationship just because I'm a human being. And I could work on developing a general belief that other people can be supportive. Okay, this may not have been your past experience, but it's something that you could continue to cultivate if you don't have it already, so not to worry. Um, another relational thing is not just relations to people, but also relation to pets. So if you're able to relate well to animals or feel that connection to pets, that's an internal resource, okay? Another thing is the capacity to communicate well, um, to express yourself, to know how to reach out to others when you want connection or you want support. Um, the ability to set boundaries, um, kind of let people know when you need a little space, um, and to give and receive emotional support. All right, so all these things are relational resources that are internal to us. Okay, but obviously, if we have relational resources without someone to relate to, it's hard to put them into practice, right? So we need actual people or pets in our life to have a relationship. So the external resource could be close friends or family a primary relationship such as a partner, um, access to support groups or other kinds of groups. It can even be like a special interest group, right? Like I used to be in a, a bicycle club where we used to get together and ride bikes every weekend and you know stuff like that. So that's just an example of a type of relationship. Um, group activities, oh, sorry, I said that all right. Um, colleagues, so at work, your work relationships can count. Um, and even, you know, sometimes it feels like, well, if it's not a best friend or if it's not a partner, it's not as important, but any kind of relationship could be, could be nice. You know, it could be a neighbor. It could be um, a niece or a nephew or a kid. It could be an older person, you know, even if it's like a, a, a smaller relationship, not your primary relationship, it still could be um, something that's valuable to you that you could recognize and, uh, and help you to capitalize on your internal relational resource. Okay, next. Okay, of course, because it's sensory motor psychotherapy, we have to talk about somatic resources. Okay, so this has to do with our soma or our body. So 
having being fortunate enough to have good health could give us access to a lot of positive things in our life. So good health, ability to connect with our body and our sensations. So to mindfully tune in and recognize what's going on within us, the ability to regulate arousal. So again, that has to do with the window of tolerance, being able to bring our arousal down or bring our arousal up when needed. Um, being able to feel grounded through our legs. Okay, that's gonna be a later lesson. So we're gonna do a lot more with that. Um, so that's kind of pressing your feet into the ground and really feeling that connection to the earth it could be very calming, especially if you feel kind of floaty and anxious. Um, being able to work with your breath, such as deep breathing exercises, or, but there's a variety of breathing exercises really. Um, using your posture, that's another lesson for later on as well. So sometimes shifting the way our posture is could affect our other building blocks, such as our mood and our thoughts and the way we feel about ourselves. Um, having supple tone muscles so you can like use them to exercise and move through the world. Um, enjoyment of sexuality and sensual activities. Um, being able to access your senses, which is actually one of the building blocks as well. Um, being able to get involved in athletic types of activities such as walking, running, dancing, whatever, okay? Being flexible, okay? So all these things and much more, obviously I can't name them all, are related to things within us that have to do with our body, somatic resource, okay? Then external, there's lots of stuff for here. As you can see, it's a, a one on the top because it's gonna be a two after this. So once you have these internal resources, it helps to have access to other things such as health clubs, gyms, exercise studios, an exercise class, um, a dance class, martial arts, whatever is in your interest that could allow you to put those into action. Um, joining a sports team, whether it's competitive or just um, recreational. Um, in your community, whether you're in the city or in you know, a rural area or a suburban area, there might be things such as walking trails, running trails, parks with trails, even ski slopes if you live in the mountains, um, skateboard parks, tennis courts, things of the, that nature. Um, in my community, I like to kayak. I have access to some waterways where I can kayak and that's a great resource for me. Um, and the equipment, you know, so sometimes you need certain equipment to use, right? So like in that picture, it shows like different kinds of balls, tennis rackets, for me, a kayak, bicycle, things like that, okay? So access to those things could help you capitalize on your inner somatic resources. Okay, so even more stuff. So health practitioners could help us to keep our, our body in check. So having access to different kinds of health practitioners could be a resource in itself, okay? I know not everybody has the money for that or access based on location or desire, but those can be helpful. So um, be doctors, chiropractors, naturopaths, herbologists, osteopaths, body workers, movement teachers, massage therapists, things like that, or other things as well. Um, even certain things in your own home could help you feel more comfortable in your body. So as you could see in the picture, like being able to take a warm bath or a hot shower or an Epsom salt bath, um, maybe a rocking chair, um, or I like um, certain you know vibrating things you put on the chair and it makes your back feel nice. Um, being able to wrap yourself in a cozy blanket, uh, you know, anything that makes your body feel good. Um, lotion, you know, scented lotion or candles, whatever, okay? Use your imagination, but those are the external things that could also help. Okay, so now emotional resources, okay? So being able to allow yourself to have access to a full range of emotional experiences. Sometimes, when we grow up, we're told, we're given certain messages that certain emotions are allowed and certain emotions are not allowed, right? So maybe it's okay if I'm having a good day and I'm happy and I'm in a good mood, but if I'm in a bad mood, I get shunned and criticized and made fun of, or don't cry, or you, girls aren't allowed to be angry or whatever it is. So I learned to limit my emotional experience. But later in life, if I learn how to expand my emotional experience, that's a great gift and not having to shove all my emotions into a small box. So having access to those full ranges of emotions, including positive emotions. Being able to tolerate our emotions, such as anger and sadness, instead of desperately trying to make them go away, especially by using desperate means that are destructive means. Not getting stuck in or run by emotion, which at DBT they call emotional mind, 
when you kind of get hijacked by your subcortical structures, as we talked about in the triune brain video. Um, the ability to express and communicate emotions, right? That could help us in relationships or could help us get support. Uh, being able to appropriately regulate our emotions in, in an effective manner, such as using sensory motor psychotherapy skills, DBT skills, radically open DBT skills, or other coping mechanisms you've used. And being able to use your emotions to guide your action, okay? Not in a destructive way, but in a positive way. Like listening to your gut feelings, your intuition or listening to what your emotions telling you about a situation and using it to help you make a decision. All right, so emotional external. All right, so now that I have this emotional capacity, it could translate into my relationships. So I could maybe have some friends or family with whom I can give and receive emotional support. So sometimes I have to work on self-regulating my emotions but other times I can co-regulate my emotions in the context of a relationship. Sometimes it helps to have access to circumstances or people that allow me to experience different emotions that have like a richer life experience. Um, being able to engage in certain activities with people can help with that. Um, and being with people where I could share excited high arousal emotions, like such as the people in the center picture like maybe they're having a good day together, they're out having lunch or, you know, sh you know, sharing a good time, going to a ball game, you know, going to a party and there's higher arousal. Other times, like on the picture on the right, maybe there's something that's a little quieter, maybe um, kind of a comforting situation. You're, you're validating, you're listening to each other, maybe you're having a difficult day, but you're sharing that emotion and you're being able to get support with each other for that lower arousal emotion. All right, so the highs and the lows. Okay, intellectual resources. So we got the picture of the brain on the left. Okay, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be super smart. Okay, it's just being able to use your mind in positive ways, resourcing ways, such as the ability to engage in creative thinking, to think things through, um, to problem solve, that's an amazing resource, right? In everyday life, we have to problem solve all the time. Having intellectual clarity. So being able to, let's say, regulate our emotions enough to have access to these intellectual resources. Also, it could just be an interest in developing the mind. Maybe I just love to learn. I like to read. I like to learn new things. I like to attend lectures. I like to watch videos. Um, and, and that's an, in, within me, just having that interest in learning, that thirst to know new stuff is resourcing. Okay, but of course we need some outside help as well. So you might need some access to actual learning experiences, classrooms, um, adult learning, schools, if you're in school, libraries, study groups, even reading materials that give you access to new information. Um, like the middle part says, sometimes it has to do with taking an online course or an online YouTube course right? Um, watching documentaries on TV, like there's some cool stuff on the History Channel and some things like that. Public television has some interesting things and you can learn even by certain TV shows or documentaries, right? Other times it's just like engaging your mind in kind of like brain activities, like, you know, Sudoku puzzles or word search or, you know, these cognitive exercises on things like Lumosity, um, learning a new language, uh, listening to audiobooks or reading a book, all that kind of stuff can count as well. Okay, so now artistic and creative resources, internal. All right, so again, you don't have to be a master at any of this. It's just the, the ability to use and enjoy your inner creativity. So let's look at the list and the stuff on the bottom. And I bet you that this button, you haven't tried everything. And if you were to try something new or bring back something you haven't done in a while, you might enjoy it. Even if you're not great at it, it still might be something that is enjoyable or interesting for you in your life now and could be resourcing for you. So enjoying listening to or playing music, dancing, poetry, writing, okay? Maybe you haven't written a, a poem since you were in high school and now you're retired and you wanna give it a try again. Why not, right? Um, sculpture, visual arts, design. Um, one time I joined a, um, a community painting group and it was mostly retired people. And some of them had never 
done art in their whole life and they started now. So why not now, right? No matter what age you are, why not give it a shot? And it might be, you know, fun. Sewing, cooking, acting, crafts, interior decorating, right? Even sprucing up your apartment or your house, landscaping, planting flowers. Right now uh, in summertime, um, you know, you can still plant some stuff if you want, or if it's a different season, you can have house plants, you know, or building something. Okay, so all this stuff, it gives you a good feeling inside if you're able to create, okay? All right, so again, um, we have these inner capacities. We need access to some equipment. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of getting a couple of things together to set yourself up. So like if you wanted to paint, it could be a matter of figuring out where there's a painting class, buying some brushes and paints and paper or canvas, depending on the type you're doing, All right? So getting the materials together can help. So you need a bunch of artistic materials and equipment, depending on which activity you're gonna do. You might need access to even things like instruments or radios, music players, um, pen and paper, even simple stuff, right? I wanna keep a journal. Well, I need to find a notebook and um, just keep that notebook as my journal and put it in a place I'm gonna use it. Boom, get myself prepared. Um, and sometimes it's uh, access to certain classes, right? Like um, in my community, there's different, through the town and through libraries and stuff, there's classes I can take. So that could be an opportunity and it's not very expensive. Other times you might wanna go a little more high end depending on what you're interested in or watch certain instructional videos online. Um, even um, access to um, community art centers, museums, um, places like that, theaters. So you could kind of just experience the art, even if you're not doing it yourself. Just being able to go and watch it helps you appreciate it. Okay, material resources. Okay, now it doesn't mean you're a materialistic person if you appreciate materialistic things, all right? Um, there's extremes where you could be very materialistic and use that as a replacement for living a more whole and balanced life. But here we're just saying the ability to appreciate certain things could be resourcing. So the ability to be able to earn money um, or like work on your bank account and keep some financial security to create a nest egg for yourself, to invest, that's an ability that could help you. Um, ability and capacity to enjoy material things. So there might be items already in your house that you enjoy. Maybe you just really love cuddling up in your bed with your soft comforter and, you know, or a nice blanket or your comfy chair, or you love looking at the decorations in your house because you did it yourself. All those things count and it, it could be very positive without being indulgent. Um, I picked the picture of this guy here because it makes me think of the show um, American Pickers. And those guys love going through old people, old stuff, antiques and things, and they have such a great appreciation for it, you know, and they sell it in their store and they probably collect it too. But some of these guys, you know, they collect all these things, but they love it and they really get pleasure out of it. So that's resourcing for them. All right. So external things. So once you're able to have the capacity to earn money or to make a living, now you have to actually have a job or have some kind of home or material things to enjoy. Uh, maybe even a car, you could appreciate that. You could appreciate your computer, your phone, because um, when you don't have it, you, you realize how much you appreciate it, right? Um, even certain things like you know appliances and stuff. Another thing that we take for granted until it breaks, what about when your refrigerator dies? Oh no. Right? We appreciate how much, we, how lucky we are to have all these things and not everybody in the world has them, right? A uh, comfortable bed, of course, if you have one. Um, certain treasured items, you know, um, even a, like having a bicycle, a piano, uh, running shoes, whatever it means to you. You might have certain treasured items that you could just remind yourself that you have and appreciate a little bit more and be grateful for. Okay, psychological. All right, so internal psychological capacities. What does this involve? Having things such as a strong sense of self, a sense of competency, like I'm able to do things and make choices and make and accomplish things, having good self-esteem, feeling okay about myself, not just for the stuff I can do or for the way that I look, but just for me being a human being, right? Being okay with myself from the inside out, feeling safe in the world um, and just a sense of being okay can really be grateful for that. Um, and even if they're not there 100% of the time, 
we could think back to times when we felt this way and appreciate it. And when it arises again, we could appreciate it again. Okay, right? we're not saying that everyone's going to be happy and perfect all the time. Well, no, right? But we can appreciate these states when they come our way and find ways to create it more. Okay, and I hope through this program, we're going to find more ways to create this stuff if you don't have it already. So don't feel bad if you're saying, oh, I don't have any of this yet. That's okay. We're, we'll get there. Um, okay, so on the right, um, talks a little bit about mindfulness, right? The ability to note our, notice our experiences. Non-judgmental self-awareness, mindfulness, right? Ability to reflect on your behavior, emotions, or thoughts. So instead of being lost in them and impulsive, you're going to step back and kind of observe or observe your urges to act a certain way or just what the feeling feels like in your body, what's going through your mind, kind of like the building blocks, right? Okay, so external psychological resources. So if you're lucky enough, access to a therapist or a therapy group. Um, perhaps even just materials like self-help books or, you know, YouTube videos, workbooks, things like that. Um, perhaps even community offerings. Um, like I do some free lectures at my local libraries, um, kind of like what I'm doing here, but in person. So, you know, there's certainly free things you could have access to in the community or perhaps even paid lectures just to learn more about yourself and about how relationships work and how your mind works and things like that. Um, support groups, 12-step groups, workshops, all that kind of stuff, all right? All right, spiritual resources, okay? So I'm not saying religion, I'm saying spiritual. So religion could be a part of this, but it doesn't have to be a part of this, right? Because I know some people um, say, well, I'm an atheist, this doesn't count for me. Okay, well, it doesn't have to be religion. Or you might have some negative associations with religion because of your upbringing, so let's be flexible with this definition, okay? So it could just simply be the ability to connect to like a higher power or your wise mind or spiritual energy or just faith, okay? It could be kind of general. Um, the ability to work with a spiritual teacher if you happen to want to do that. Engaging in prayer or meditation, okay? So prayer could be more religious. Meditation could be a little bit more secular or mindfulness practice the capacity to experience reverence. So that means that sense of awe that the world and life is so much bigger than me. I'm just a small component. Um, I'm not the center of the universe, but that's okay. And I could be in awe of all the amazing things that are around me. Okay, you could see life as everything's a miracle or nothing's a miracle. And there's so many miracles that are here that we could appreciate. Um, sensing one's own essence or spiritual nature. So they say that we all have an inner um, higher power, so to speak. We have a higher self that's connected with spirit. So when you hear the term namaste, it means the spirit in me connects with the spirit in you, okay? Um, Kundalini yoga, sat nam, means truth is my identity, which basically means that you know, my higher self, spirit self, is my true identity, okay? So all of these things are spiritual in nature. All right, so next, spiritual external. So sometimes, you know, we could take those inner capacities and connect to outside experiences. It could be joining a meditation group. It could be going to a religious service, if you're into that. Um, if your family engages in practices together, like a family prayer time, grace over meals, that could be something that's special to you. Um, if you're, you know, very religious, you might observe a, a Sabbath or a Shabbat. Um, and kind of you know take that day to have that day of rest and spiritual reflection. Um, engaging in spiritual religious ceremonies, right? It could be summer solstice day, or it could be Christmas, or it could be Hanukkah, or it could be Passover, whatever you know it is for you, Ramadan. Um, Bible study, some people really enjoy that. Um, really looking at spiritual literature, whether it's the Bible or other books. There's other kind, many, many, many books out there. Um, spiritual poetry or readings, okay, so, and access to spiritual teachers, if you're looking for one, okay? All right, it's a lot of categories, isn't there? Okay, so nature, um, so nature intern, it's like, why is this internal? <laughs> so, because we have a capacity to connect with nature, so we might have that ability to go out into nature, into a park, into the woods, by the beach, and appreciate all the sensory experiences that we could be around. Appreciate the largeness of nature and the smallness of myself. 
right? Enjoying activities in natural settings. Okay, like the girl on the left looks like she's going on a hike and I wish I was there right now too, because I love to hike. Um, you could do dirt biking in nature, you know, we use all kinds of stuff you could do. Um, gardening, for sure, inter inside or outside. Uh, that's something that's accessible to most people. Even if you just have an apartment with a balcony, you could probably get a couple of plants or a couple of house plants. Um, and just being able to appreciate the seasons, right? The change of seasons, if that's where you live, you know, like the summer has a special side to it. Fall, the change of the, the leaves, the snow in the winter time, things first blooming in spring, right? So if we have that ability to appreciate that, that's an internal capacity. All right, but of course, external, it's nice to have external access as well. So maybe you've had some access to um, nature walks, nature trails, um, being able to appreciate things like rocks and flowers and other natural elements, trees. Um, you know, it might even be going to a garden store to do that or just walking around your neighborhood, depending on where you live. Um, being Enjoying looking at wildlife. Um, I have a bird feeder outside my house that looks something like what's in that picture. And I like watching all the little birds come by. So things like that could be fun or even just seeing other kind of natural uh, like squirrels, iguanas, depending on where you live, right? Um, and being able to appreciate beautiful nature, nature scenery. So it depends on where you're from and where you're traveling, right? But it could be beaches, forests, mountains, lakes, oceans, um, even just looking up in the sky. Sometimes you can see the stars at night or the moon and that's really nice. Okay, so we made it. That's a whole lot of categories, isn't it? Um, if you made it to this point, congratulations. <laughs> if you had to pause the tape and try a couple times, no problem, I understand it's kind of long. All right, so we're gonna do a few exercises together. So if you're up for it for now, keep going. Otherwise, you could always come back another time. All right, so I hope you were taking some notes along the way, because as you can see, it's a whole lot of material. So now that you kind of identified, hopefully, um, some of the creative resources in the different categories, I want you to kind of describe how they impact your body. So think about how the internal resources it, it could impact your body sensations and how the external ones can too. So um, you could kind of go through your list and maybe take some notes about that. Okay, so this one looks a little complicated, but not to worry, I will explain. So for each category of resource, I want you to think of how you might have used it as a survival resource in the past, and then kind of talk about how you could use it as a creative resource now. Okay, so for example, let's look at the material. Okay, so let's say in the past, I was really struggling. I was very stressed out, um, had a lot of relationship problems, struggling with the aftermath of trauma. And to run away from it, I became a bit of a, a shopaholic and I was shopping all the time. I was buying a lot of stuff. I was kind of focusing all my energy on buying stuff and the immediate rush of buying something to take my mind off of my stress. And that in the moment was adaptive for me and it helped, but at the same time, I collected way too much stuff. I spent way too much money. I got things I didn't need. But now I may not want to use it to that extreme, but I might want to just appreciate some of the things that I have, but have less. Okay, so there might be still some belongings that I have that I cherish, but I don't need to compulsively buy all the time. See how that could shift? Okay, in another video, I also referenced for myself that um, I used to use intellectual resource as a survival resource, right? I was going through a lot of stress in my life, a lot of difficulties, and I threw myself into my, my schoolwork. I studied, I spent way too much time on that, but it was to block out other problems that I had. So now I still enjoy learning and I like to read, and I like to do these videos and stuff, but it's not to block out things in my life, it's to enhance my life, okay? So think about how that might be playing out for you in these different categories, okay? And it's okay if you still use survival resources in, in a survival manner, but there's also the chance that now that you recognize how you're doing that, that you could shift it into a more moderate, um, healthy, creative resource style. Okay. All right, so now embodying a resource. Okay, so when we engage in these different resource activities, it impacts the way our body feels. So I want you to think about a creative resource on your list 
that you think you would like to use a little bit more often. And remember a time when you actually were using that resource. So maybe um, you really used to like to ride your bike, but it's been a while. So think about the times when you used to ride in a neighborhood or ride on a trail and how that used to feel. How did that affect your five senses? How did that affect your body sensations, the movements you made or wanted to make? How did it affect your arousal? Did it increase your arousal or decrease your arousal? Did it change your posture, your facial expression, just even thinking about it, okay? So kind of think about how did that positive resource affect my body? And chances are maybe it made your body feel pretty good, okay? But just get, get into some details here using these building blocks, okay? So then um, if you wanna have a little added extra twist, you could use a diagram like that or just kind of sketch it out the way you like to sketch it and just write on there in different spots like where you experience the resource. So maybe like you draw a little squiggle on the chest and say, you know, I felt like my chest opened up a little bit. Or you write something to the back and you say, I felt like my posture straightened up a little bit. Or my chin lifted. Or I took a deep breath and you put an arrow toward your chest, right? So things like that. Um, and you could use this, uh, this kind of diagram for other exercises as well, if, that, if you like it. Um, they just happen to have it in the textbook for this particular one, so that's why I put it here. But having that visual um, sometimes could be helpful. Could be a resource uh, using your uh, artistic uh, resources here, creative. So after you identify some of the sensations that you experience, as you think about that positive resource you want to use more often, how does it then affect the building blocks of your thinking and your emotions? And with the thinking, also think about what meaning are you now giving to that resource? So if you can do that, if you could, let's say, let's say your resource is riding your bike and I could spend a few days a week riding my bike, how would it make me feel about myself? What does it tell me about me that I took the time to do that? Okay, so that's about building that positive element of identity that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So here's a way we could kind of practice using resources if we're having a bad day. So it's kind of like using them like a coping skill. So you might use them throughout your week just naturally anyway, but you could also use them on purpose if you're struggling, okay? So let's say I decide to use this exercise and I'm having a bad day, all right? So I had a, a difficult interaction with somebody at work and I'm a little stressed about it and I came home and my head's still spinning. I'm still obsessing about it. Um, so think about like, okay, I had this bad day. This thing happened. How is that impacting my different building blocks? Okay, do I have any beliefs or judgments about myself or other people? Like, how is it affecting my body? Um, how, what kind of emotions am I having? So just go through the building blocks there. Okay, so now we're going to try to turn it around. So what kind of resources can I use to turn around my bad day? All right, so I can look at those different categories or look at the list you made and think of what can I try today that actually might help. So give it a try, um, best effort, and then re-examine your building blocks and see how it impact, impacted your building blocks. Okay, uh, we made it, we got to the end, you guys. Woo, that was a long one. Um, I hope the length didn't deter you too much, but this is a really useful one as you can see. So I hope you'll give it a try. Um, hang in there and uh, be resourceful. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll see you soon, everybody. Take care.